Well, good morning, IEC. Uh, to those who uh, haven't had the privilege of meeting, I'm Pastor Steve, and uh, to our, our team leading us in worship and song, thank you all so much today. It's uh, great always to have you up here regular. You've been away for a little bit, so it's good to have you back. And uh, that last song was a new song for us, uh, but it ties directly in to the passage that we're in today. We're, um, during Christmas season, uh, we're looking at the songs, the real songs of Christmas. Now, if you're here with us, you know we typically preach through books of the Bible. And during Christmas, we are looking at five different responses that various people or groups of people had when they heard the message that a Savior, a Savior is being born. Last week, we heard uh, Elizabeth, her response when she heard that a Savior is coming and you're about to give birth to the man who will be the forerunner to the Savior. Well, this week, we look at Mary's response. Uh, the song that Mary sings is often called the Magnificat, where Mary, in response to the news that she is carrying the Savior of the world, she sings out. In that last song we, we sang, uh, the words come directly from the passage we're looking at today. Now, when we talk about Mary, she's an uh, uh, interesting figure in Scripture. Many traditions, including some uh, traditions here in Ethiopia uh, and traditions that we see really throughout the world, place uh, an emphasis on Mary that wouldn't be biblically faithful. Sometimes uh, some traditions look to make Mary more out to be more than the scriptures say that she is. Some traditions will say that Mary was sinless, that Mary had no other children. Some traditions say that Mary uh, never died, she just ascended. Some will even pray to Mary, saying if we pray to Jesus' mother, She's going to really be able to get Jesus to do whatever we ask. Sort of like when, when Jesus was turning the water into wine, they come and get Mary and say, Go ask your son to do this. And that's what some traditions hold to. Also, some traditions in response often to an overemphasis of Mary, sometimes we will almost ignore Mary. We'll forget that there's a unique calling that only Mary had. Mary, the one woman throughout all time, throughout all history of humanity, she's the only woman who would carry God in her womb. She's the only woman who would carry God who became flesh, who lowered himself to become like us. No, Mary is very very unique among all women to ever live, yet we can easily overemphasize her or conversely underemphasize her. What we're going to see today is that one of the great things Mary is, she's a fabulous example of faith. What does it mean to have faith and trust in God? And that's what we're talking about today. This song that we look at today, it's a song about many things, but one of the emphasis that Mary places is her trust in God Almighty in this song. So let's read our passage today. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 55. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. But we're going to stand for the reading of God's Word, and the passages will be on the screen uh, if you don't have a Bible with you. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. 
He has scattered the proud in the, the thoughts of their heart. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the humble of estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, praise be to God. You may be seated. God, your word does declare that all men are like grass. And that all our glories like the flowers of the field, the grass indeed withers and the flowers fade. But it is your word, O Lord, that stands forever. We ask that this be the word that is faithfully preached today as we recognize that unless you speak through your word and through your servant, nothing of any true eternal significance will be spoken. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of the story we looked at last week. Last week we saw the story of Elizabeth and even her husband Zachariah. And this week we see Mary. And to, we're going to go back a little bit in the chapter 1 of Luke and look at some things that happened with Mary. In Luke chapter 1 verse 26, it says in the sixth month, the sixth month since the angel had gone to Elizabeth and said, you're going to carry a child. The six month after that, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. In these two verses here, we learn a lot about Mary. We learn a lot about her situation and even her family background. First, we see this town called Nazareth. In the Old Testament, you never see Nazareth mentioned. This is the first mentioning of this city, Nazareth, in our Bible. And it's a city that would be viewed very insignificantly. In fact, in John chapter 1, upon hearing that the Messiah was Jesus of Nazareth, the response is, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was a small town. Whatever you think of in, in your culture and context and where you're from of being a little insignificant town, where you'd say, I can't believe anyone's from there. That was the view of Nazareth. Yet Nazareth also is unique in that it's surrounded by Gentiles. It's in Israel, but it's in an area that will be surrounded by the peoples of the world, the nations. And that's where God, in His goodness, in His wisdom, in His divine plan, where God chose to take on flesh and enter the world and grow up. Now, He entered the world in Bethlehem, but this would be where Jesus' parents lived. Nazareth, an insignificant town. Now, it also mentions this. It says she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Now that word betrothed, it's not a word I use very often. I almost never hear it used. So it's a word that we really don't have a lot of context for, especially uh, from our various cultures. Some cultures probably get this idea of betrothal better than I do. You see, my culture, when someone wants to get married, we have what we call, we have sort of have two stages. We have engagement. That's where the, the man says, will you marry me? And the decision is made to get married. And during engagement, there's a waiting for a wedding. But during engagement, I know people that have broken off the engagement. Where they've said, hey, we're not going to get married. Betrothal is very different from engagement. Betrothal has a weight, a heaviness to it. You see, when... A man and woman in ancient Israel got betrothed. It was the first step of marriage. The commitment was as deep as marriage. Everything pretty much had been done. The commitment had been made. It was a heavy commitment. Everything had happened except the consummation of the marriage. 
The man and the woman were not living together as husband and wife yet, yet the commitment carried the same weight as if they were married. Here's what happened during betrothal. In this culture, uh, it's a lot more like Ethiopian culture. They would, often the families would gather and meet and talk about, hey, my son, I think he would be a good match for your daughter. And they would decide, often for the children, often marriages were arranged. And people typically got married at a pretty young age. So during this period of betrothal, what would happen is the man would live with his parents. A lot like Ethiopian culture. Most children in Ethiopian culture, it seems, do not leave their home until they get married. My culture is just the opposite. In fact, Ethiopian culture, if, if you have a, a son or a daughter who's not married and they move out of the house, parents often, I see some eyes there, parents often feel offended. Why would you leave my home? You're not married. Stay with us. My culture. If you have a child, 18, 19, 20, and they haven't moved out of the house, everybody's looking at you thinking, you haven't raised your children where they can go and take care of themselves, where they, where they can do life on their own. They need to grow up and be able to go and live somewhere else. And it would almost be an insult to the family if a child at that age remained at home. You see, our, our, so many places, cultures are quite the opposite of one another. But here, it's the same as Ethiopian culture. During that betrothal period, a man would live with his father and mother. And typically, he learned to do what his father did. And here's how he prepared for marriage. He would have to build a house and prove that he had the financial means to feed, clothe, and shelter his bride. He had to do that during that period to show it. So he would prepare the house and the bride would be waiting, going, he's coming to get me. He's going to come and get me when he has the means to take care of me. Now often, that young man would build the, his home right next to his parents' home. But he'd have to have his own home to take care of his bride. So they're in this period where Joseph, every day he's waking up, he's a carpenter, working on this home, getting ready. The quicker he moves on this home, the quicker he gets to marry Mary, so he can't wait to get the home done. They're in this betrothal period. Now, Mary, most likely, in this culture, would have been around the age 13, 14, 15. She'd have been very young, probably for any of our cultures, current day, to be getting married. I don't know many cultures uh, that where women get married quite that young. Joseph, he would probably have been three or four years older than Mary. 16, 17, 18, somewhere around there. He was a little bit ahead. That was very typical in that culture. So he's preparing. So it says, Mary, they're in Nazareth, betrothed. And the third word I want to point out, it mentions that Mary was a virgin. She had never been with a man. Now that's significant. She'd never been intimate with a man. Now, this is very theologically significant because God's Son would enter the world unlike any other man. Fully human, but without sin. You see, the sin nature is passed on from father to child, father to child, going all the way back to the garden. So uh, Jesus would not have an earthly father. Now, in verse um, 28, skipping down to uh, verse 28, it says, And he came and said, this is what the angel says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting it might be. Again, you don't know if an angel's bringing good news or bad news. And the angel in verse 30 says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Young girl, living at home with her family, waiting for Joseph to come get her. I'm sure like so many, she had dreams of life. But this wasn't part of her dream. 
This wasn't something she had anticipated ever happening. That she would be with child before she was married. You see, like in our day and time, if any young woman showed up and said, no, I'm, I'm a virgin, but I'm having a child, everybody would look at her with doubt, with skepticism. This girl is a liar. She's trying to deceive us. And undoubtedly, that's how Mary would be viewed. Everybody would question and doubt Mary. So what she's about to carry is a heavy load. She's got a weight right from the start of this announcement. God announces something to her. This is what your life's going to be like. And as wonderful as this is, I can still imagine Mary going, that's great, but I'd rather not take it. I'd rather not deal with everybody looking at me, calling me a liar, believing that scandal has happened, not trusting me. I don't want to deal with the scorn and the shame and everything going on. I can imagine she goes, I don't want what you have for me, Lord. Ever been like that? The Lord has something for you. And you know there's goodness and joy and beauty in what he has for you. But you also look and go, God, isn't there another way? Isn't there something else you have for me, God? God, did you come to the right person? Someone else must be better qualified to do what you've called me to. Someone else can do this better than me. I don't want it. Mary could have easily responded that way. Right from this moment, she's going to be carrying a heavy weight, a scandalous weight that everybody would view her with question. Now in verse 38, it says, Mary, here's her response. Behold, I am your ser the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. How do we respond when God leads us, directs us, calls us to something that's hard? Send me, I'll go, God. God, give me the strength to be faithful. I'm your servant. I'll do as you ask, God. That's how Mary responds. And Mary goes to the one woman that she knows that could relate to her. I found when, um, when the Lord often leads us to things that are difficult that we don't understand, sometimes people don't understand what we're doing around us. They don't understand why the God has called us to this. We find great comfort in those who can relate to what we're going through. So probably the only woman at this time who would have any understanding of what Mary's going through is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is going to have a miraculous birth, uh, having a child beyond age of having a child. She's probably the only woman who would believe Mary. So Mary, with this news, goes to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, and see her. And whenever she goes to visit the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumps for joy. We saw that last week. And Mary begins to sing. I love this beautiful song. And in this song, what Mary is doing is reminding herself of the truths of God and why we can trust Him. That's so important. Whenever we're in a season, we're going, God, what are you doing here? I don't understand this. To remind ourselves that we can trust God. There's truths He has given us that we can stand on. So Mary begins to sing, My soul magnifies the Lord. To, the, the word magnify is a word that means to take something that may be perceived as small and make it great. To make it big. And that's what she's going to do. She's going to say, My soul magnifies the great glory of God. May your small, humble servant, may the glory and majesty 
of a magnificent, huge God show through your little servant. My soul magnifies you. May people see through Mary like a magnet how great God is. Something little sowing something to be huge. And that's God. God is huge. And Mary's going to show God to be magnificent. And during this song, Mary's going to quote Scripture over and over and over again. She's going to quote from Isaiah. She's going to quote from Samuel with Hannah's song. She's going to quote from Genesis with Leah. She's going to quote from Isaiah. She's going to take this song that she sings and bring Old Testament Scripture to life. Get this, Mary, she knew the Word of God. Mary knew and understood the Word of God. And when she begins to break forth in song, what bleeds from her heart is songs of truth about God. She sings about His glory. She says, I rejoice in God my Savior. He's looked on my humble estate. And get this, we talk about Mary from generation to generation they're going to call Mary blessed. But listen, in Mary's lifetime, during her time on earth, I don't think many called her blessed. Her son, famous to many, infamous to others. Her son who would go to a cross, whose life would start with scandal as people questioned the legitimacy of his birth. Yet from generation to generation after Mary, after her life, they'll call her blessed. Sometimes the things God does in our lives, sometimes the hard things you go through here and now, the blessing of those may not come until the Lord brings you home. May not come till later. You may be watching from eternity and going, God, I can't believe you used my little bit of faithfulness for that, to impact people in that way. And God can do that, and Mary recognizes that. And she says in verse 49, For he who is mighty has done great things for me. I want, if you've got your bullets, and I'm going to look at seven things that Mary recounts as the great things God has done for her. These are things that God still does for us. Like I said, anytime we're in those seasons where we're going, what is God doing? Can I trust you? It's so good to go back to Scripture. Say, God, you've reminded us of who you are. And that's what Mary does here. So I'm going to show you seven great things that she recalls. Seven magnificent truths that Mary trusts about God. In verse 50. She says, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. First thing we're going to see is that God is merciful to those who fear him. The fear of the Lord. Sometimes we view the fear of the Lord as very negative. And there can be a negative aspect to fearing the Lord. Where we're afraid if we do anything wrong, he's going to hurt us or harm us. And we, we live in total fear. No, for the Christian... We know that we've been forgiven of our sin. We don't have to live in fear. Yet our faith journey, our trusting the Lord, starts with fear. Nobody becomes a Christian unless there's some fear in recognition of this. I have sinned against a holy God. Because of my sin... And the weight of my sin, I deserve death. Scripture declares the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve because of my sin. We don't like that. We don't like the reality that we are sinful. Yet, when we hear that the wages of sin is death, and it's not just talking about a physical death. No, it's talking about a spiritual death. An eternal death, eternally separated from God. That's the wages of sin that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. Death. And we should have a fear of that. It's healthy to look at that and go, I fear that. I don't want that. Lord, I want you. I desire to live for you, to walk with you, to know you, to be with you. And it's that fear that leads us to the mercy of God that is given to us through Christ. So Mary starts with the mercy of God. 
He's merciful to those who fear Him. Those who have no fear of God, they don't recognize their need for God. They don't recognize their need for the mercy of God. So she starts with, God is merciful. What a beautiful truth. In those moments of trial, remember, our God is a God of mercy. Second, she, uh, she mentions in verse 51, he, uh, he, has shown, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. The proud. Here's what it means. Here's the heart of pride. I can do it. I'm the center of the world. I don't need God. You see, the humble recognize this. Life's not about me. My life's to glorify God. And we lower ourselves as we magnify God. The proud want to magnify themselves and make little of God. And here, it says that the proud will be scattered in their thoughts. What's that idea? The proud try to figure out what this life is about. What's our purpose? What am I living for? And the proud chase all sorts of things that don't have eternal meaning, eternal purpose, eternal value, looking to find something that those things will never deliver. And Mary here reminds us, the proud are scattered. They're living for themselves. They're never going to find true life. Their hearts and minds are scattered. In verse 52, it says, He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. Third thing we see is he's brought, He brings down the mighty. And these seven things we see, four of them are sort of more positive. Three of them we consider a little more negative. Here, the mighty, those who on earth live in their own strength. Those who use their strength to oppress others, to hurt others, to push others down. God will bring them down. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. When we look at injustice and people being harmed and hurt and uh, We look and go, God, how can you allow this? We go, God, one day you will bring down the mighty. In that same verse 52, it says he's exalted those of humble estate. Powerful truth. Remember this. Sometimes we look and we go, God, I'm so insignificant. There's people that are more famous than me. He'll have more power, more influence, more money, whatever it is. There's always somebody with a lot more. And we go, God, you, people seem to have so much more than me. And here we remind ourselves that God exalts the humble. He lifts up the humble. We're going to be surprised when we get to glory. Those who we look at and we go, they lived an amazing, faithful life, and we probably never heard of them. They're not famous. They don't have biographies written about them. The faithful prayer warrior, the humble servant who declared faithfully the Lord each and every day in their home and beyond. God lifts up the humble. That idea for lifting up, we see it in James, it's this word oopsie. It's it's like God just like like you take a baby. We have a phrase in English that we say when, when someone has a baby, they'll pick up a baby and they'll say oopsie daisy and throw the baby in the air. And it takes very little strength to toss a baby in the air and catch them. That's what God does for the humble. It takes very little effort for God to lift up the humble and exalt them. And Mary reminds herself, God exalts the humble. The proud, he'll bring down. In verse 53, it says, He has filled the hungry with good things. So, fifth thing, God fills the hungry. Jesus says, uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that they're going to be filled in the Sermon on the Mount. That as we hunger and thirst for righteousness, God fills us. He meets those needs. In verse 53, reading on, it says, And the rich he sent away empty. Sixth thing, God sends away empty the rich. Now, When Scripture speaks of the rich, often it's speaking of it in this context. The rich who say, I have all I need. I have no need of God. I have enough money. I have enough food. 
I have enough shelter. I have all I'll ever need. Why do I need God? The rich. God sends them away empty. Because for a person to have everything this world can offer, wealth, power, influence, whatever it may be, that person knows the reality of this. Without God, they are empty. They're empty. Oh, study the lives of, of wealthy, powerful people. And you see a great brokenness and emptiness in their life if they do not have the Lord. They're broken. And she recognizes here, the Lord sends the rich away empty. And the final thing she reminds herself of in verse 54, it says, He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy. God helps His servant that's who we're called to be as, as, as for the Christian. We're called to be a servant of the Lord. And as we serve the Lord, as we live for His glory, He helps us. Don't forget this. Many of you came in here today with burdens, concerns, weights, heavy loads, things that you don't know what are going to happen. Know that God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He doesn't promise how he's going to bring all those things to resolution, but he will not leave you or forsake you. He is with you. The Lord helps his servant. Look at the last thing it says in verse 55. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Remember the mercy of the Lord. You know, today that's what we're going to do. Today is one of my favorite Sundays of the year. We're, we're going to celebrate baptism, and I'm going to invite Pastor Mike on up here, and we're going to celebrate baptism today. Actually, we're blessed. We've got about over 50 people right now pursuing baptism, but we can only do eight or nine a service. So we're going to do baptism this service and next. Then we're going to do Baptism in January, one Sunday, and then we have another baptism date in February. So we've, for the next few months, one Sunday a month, we'll be celebrating God's mercy, God's goodness, God, uh, that God saves those who are humble a state, those who fear Him. So today we get to celebrate that. Mike's going to come and share a little bit of the process that we walk with people through and what we do, but I want to pray for us and pray for those that are being baptized today. Lord, today we remember that you are a merciful God. Lord, we do not deserve your mercy. Because of our sin, we deserve death. Lord, that doesn't even feel good to say. We don't like talking about the death we deserve. But in your mercy, you have made a way for us to be made right with you through your son, Jesus. And Lord, we look today at when you were coming into the world. You took on flesh. And you came to save the humble of a state. You come to save those who fear you who know that they can't save themselves with religious practices, they can't save themselves with power, with money, with influence, with anything like that. The only thing that will save them is to throw themselves on your mercy and recognize that Jesus indeed has saved. So Lord, as we celebrate baptism today, may we celebrate boldly and mightily. May we, who have trusted you, be reminded of our baptism. For we said... We recognize we can't save ourselves, and it's only Jesus that can save. So Lord, we pray for those being baptized today, that today would be a special reminder for them that you have saved them, and that throughout their life they would look back to this and go, I have trusted in the Lord, and like Mary, I will continue to trust in the Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.